Hi friends, Janelli here from Blooming Lotus. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. I promised that I would talk about my latest experience. So I'm hoping not to get emotional. I feel like I have recovered and I'm working on the healing process where I don't get emotional every time I talk about this, but it is a very difficult process and it's a very difficult experience. So let's get into it. pregnant on February 14th on Valentine's Day. Yes, it happened. I wasn't expecting it, but here we are. Um, so I found out at five weeks, I missed the period, took a test, positive, tear, tear, tears, super excited. It was rough because the fear alone, like, okay, is this going to be a successful pregnancy or we're gonna have another miscarriage like I'm trying to get my brain wrapped around what the future might pot potentially hold and unne <laughs> it's uh, unnecessary like you can't do that to yourself but I did have a lot of hope I am a Buddhist as I don't know if you've if, if I've said it before but I'm Buddhist and I chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo every day and and I prayed to the universe to please protect me and my baby, right? And so for a few weeks, I was very excited. I was having a lot of symptoms. Um, I had, you know, the nausea, the tiredness, the sore, tender breasts, and the moodiness. Um, most important to, to point out that whenever I've had symptoms, Whenever it stops, I know that that's the moment that the uh, embryo starts stops growing. So I just had like a daily checkup, right, to myself. Okay, what are my symptoms? And I was writing everything down. I said, okay, nausea, yes, no, uh, tenderness, tiredness, sleepiness, and things like that. And it all checked out. I had symptoms every single day for all of those weeks up to nine weeks. The day before my first ultrasound, which was on a Tuesday, so that Monday before the first ultrasound, um, I didn't feel nausea. I didn't feel anything. And so I called my mother, of course, and I let her know, like, tomorrow's my ultrasound. I'm not feeling very confident. Um, it's hard. <laughs> um, I'm not feeling very confident, like, I don't have any symptoms, so I'm scared. So she was like, oh, no, no, for one day, you shouldn't think that that's the end, you know? And my husband said the same thing. He said, you know, one day of not feeling nausea doesn't mean that the pregnancy is over. But in my heart, I was like, I don't know. I've been feeling consistently sick every day and not in a bad way, but I've been, you know, very grateful that I've been feeling those symptoms even though they sucked because they're not happy feelings. But every single day that I had the symptoms was a reassurance that my pregnancy was still okay. And so the day before the ultrasounds, no symptoms. Okay, so what does that mean, right? The next day, of course, I go to my ultrasound and sadly, there was no heartbeat. And by nine weeks, you should have a heartbeat. Actually, by six, seven, eight weeks, you should already start seeing uh, potential heartbeat but at nine weeks I had nothing and so we decided to wait one more week just in case we were off but the doctor I have to say this my doctor is amazing and I absolutely love her and I feel even like we were friends <laughs> we've been friends but um, I was never expecting this reaction from her she cried like she bawled and I looked at her and I was like in shock I hadn't cried I was like super serious I was like and she was like, I'm so sorry. And she started crying because she was very excited that, you know, I was pregnant again. It had been a year since my last pregnancy, a little over a year actually. And so she was very excited and she was really looking forward to it. And so as, you know, a, a, to see a medical doctor break from their, you know, fact-based responses and go into an emotional-based response, it really, really impacted me and, and like shook me like, oh wow, this woman is invested in like my well-being and my wellness and you know, my fertility in general because we've been working together for so many years. 
And so to see her break down like that, it was just like really, really intense for me. <clears throat> so that was really rough. Um, my first reaction really was just disappointment. Just like um, my world sank, but also it just kind of like, it confirmed my suspicion, right? And I was like, okay, well, you know, you guys were wrong, I was right, and I don't like to be right if it's something terrible and sad, obviously, but I was almost mentally preparing for this moment because the night before, again, I wasn't feeling anything. So, yeah, it was confirmed and so I had to make a decision if I wanted to go through it naturally use the misoprostol pill or the um, DNC which is um, dilating and curatage so basically they would it, it's um, an invasive procedure you would go under completely and no no um, incision necessarily because it's intra intrauterine um, and intravaginal so they just decided to do that and the reason why I went with it this time even though I know the healing process takes longer than doing it naturally it really was because they they wanted to study the contents of the tissue and the fetus and see and seek answers and so because I hadn't had answers in the past you know I just I just needed something and so we decided to go with that. It was a very rough process, emotionally and physically. Um, the It's ambulatory, so you know the recovery is pretty quick when it comes to coming off the meds and stuff like that, but when it came to like the physical pain, I was in pain for about an extra week. Um, didn't want to take the medication, but ended up taking it anyway, even though it is very strong, but the pain was like double over pain. So I also took some time off work. It took almost a month off work to rest because during my last, um, miscarriage, I didn't take any time off work and I was like, I can do this. I just need work as a distraction, all that fun stuff. And it, what happened really was that it, it the emotional toll that the miscarriage took was reflected in my work. And I don't ever want to say like, oh, I put out shitty work because my brain wasn't there or my mind wasn't right. So this time I made the decision and then I talked to my, my superiors and I was like, I'm taking time off. Whatever we need to do, whatever paperwork we need to do to fill out. And I was so happy to hear from my boss that you know, that they would do everything and anything to give me the time off that I needed and deserved and come back, you know, refreshed and renewed. So we did that. Um, but it's funny because, not funny, but it's interesting because the healing process literally took the entire time that I was off, the physical part. Um, I literally bred for, bled for, for three weeks, which was a lot. Um, also had the opportunity to, to visit family, which was much needed. Um, I saw my sister, my father, my brother, my mother-in-law, um, had a little vacation, just a couple of days of changing my environment and being with people who I love, which I don't have a lot where I live in Texas. All of my friends and family are in other places of the world. And so, I mean, all over the place, but the family that I've created here that I've built here in Texas has been magnificent like for my birthday yes we're showing it again my diy 40 i'm so happy about it uh, for my birthday i had 10 people over and it's 10 of the closest people here in texas and included family and included co-workers and very close intimate friends and friends in faith from my buddhist practice and so it was a beautiful experience to have these people and be surrounded by love and so instead of being <laughs> in my sweatpants, eating a pint of ice cream, depressed on my birthday, I spent it with people that really, really value me and I value them as well. So I just honestly needed to take that time off to not just be by myself and heal and, 
and seek my therapist and seek different practices to ground myself and even like call into ancestral practices for my healing. So it's just, it's been an experience. Now, here are the answers, right? And uh, normally I wouldn't go into so many details until I had a little bit more, but I think that it, there is value in, in sharing where I am at this point instead of waiting for that major announcement that says, here's how I got there. Well, we're documenting everything, so here we go. Um, a couple of days ago, I had my virtual appointment with my doctor that had all of the results from my CNC and the studies that were made after that. And so it turned out that it was a chromosomal anomaly, a chromosome anomaly. So this anomaly that I went through is called trisomy. So a very well-known trisomy is trisomy 21, which is the Down syndrome gene. So as we have 23 chromosomes each, parent, mother, father, right? And so as those 23 chromosomes come together, it, it becomes 46. And so it has to match exactly the same. I know I'm sharing my nails as an example. And it has to match exactly the same to create the formation that is a human being, right? Or it would be a typical human formation, right? atypical not typical atypical would be a trisomy and so trisomies usually do not generate viable life except for one or two different types and the well-known type that i just mentioned is trisomy 21 which is the one the uh the down syndrome gene mine was trisomy 15. And so there's not a title for that one. It just means that on line number 15, instead of having two, there was three. And so this type of formation does not sustain life. So the body is perfect, you guys. The body knows exactly what it's doing. Science does its own thing and says, you know what? This isn't sustainable for life. So we're going to discard it. And so of course, once it stops growing, you stop feeling symptoms and eventually I would have probably aborted naturally. But what I went through is called a missed miscarriage. So instead of waiting for it to happen naturally, we went in and extracted it. So that's a little bit of the scientific explanation as to what happened in my scenario, my case. Um, spiritually, I do realize that I mean, yes, the body is perfect, but when you ask for something, be careful what you wish for, because you're gonna get it. So I asked for protection, and I asked for protection the, the morning of my um, ultrasound, and I said, whatever will be, will be. Anything that needs to happen will happen, and all I want is my protection for health and safety for me and or my child. And I said it in a way that as soon as it came out of my airspace, I wanted to take it back. Cause I said, that means so many things. And that could potentially mean if the universe wants to protect me and my life and my health, that this possibly could mean a miscarriage because it's a protection. It's a form of protection. So that's how I interpreted that, that it was a form of protection and, and that Things happen the way that they're supposed to happen and and with or without medical or scientific intervention, something was going to happen or something had to happen. So that's my interpretation of that experience. What, go, what happens next? So what happens next is one of the suggestions from my um, OBGYN was if I do still want to conceive, naturally, quote unquote, biologically, I said, um, then IVF is probably the best option for me. Will I do it? I haven't made the decision yet. Um, other options would obviously include adoption, surrogacy, and things like that. And I have not made a decision yet, but I will keep you posted. Um, I do have an appointment with the fertility doctor in about two months many things can happen from here to two months 
but I am looking forward to it and I'm looking forward to learning more, to, to understanding better what the IVF or any type of fertility treatment process would look like. Um, my doctor does say that she doesn't think that I have a fertility issue per se, but of course with age and now that I've turned 40, it is more likely that chromosomal anomalies and issues will come about. And also of course, increasing the, the possibility of Down syndrome and other issues that may come up because of my age. Even though I'm perfectly healthy, my reproductive health is in perfect order and I have never had any issues. And I do wanna point this out. I do not have any reproductive issues except for some polyps, six polyps that were removed in 2018 from my uterus. Aside from that, I don't suffer from polycystic ovarian syndrome. I don't suffer from fibromas. I don't suffer from anything aside from that. And so for me, mentally, it's just very difficult to, to accept and understand that I'm not able to conceive naturally, but I had to get over that hump. I really had to get over it because whenever I heard the word, oh, IVF or oh, adoption, it almost felt like whoever was suggesting it to me was giving up on me without even knowing my medical history, what I've gone through, my health, nothing. And so it just made me feel some kind of way, but not in an offended way, it was more like, my own hangups about myself. It's like, oh, I'm not good enough. And this is very normal in the process of grief after miscarrying. Um, my body fails me, I'm not good enough. What could I have done differently, better? There is absolutely nothing. And I'm gonna tell you this from the words of my doctor, there is absolutely nothing, no food, no lifestyle changes, nothing that I could have done differently to avoid a trisomy. It just happened when the egg and the sperm got together. That's basically a fluke is what they call. But like she said, with the with age, the fluke is much more likely because it's just the way it is. So yeah, next steps means research, investigation, and making decisions. So if any of this resonates with you, I would love to hear a little bit about your thoughts, your stories, your opinions. Um, obviously, you know, I take all the uh, opinions with a grain of salt because we're all different. Our bodies are different. Our lifestyles, backgrounds, ethnicity, gender, all of that is so different. And so we, I just want to have a conversation with you and see, you know, what you went through. And I want to start that conversation with you today. Um, I feel more hopeful because I know it's not me. <laughs> um, having answers helps, guys. And so if you are struggling to find answers, I suggest that you get a second, third, fourth opinion, visit different doctors, research, find Facebook or social media groups, Reddit groups, whatever you need to do to get yourself equipped and prepared to make those decisions and move forward with your plan or path if that's the choice that you have to continue to move forward after recurring miscarriages, which is a supposedly very small percentage of women who go through that. In my research, it said 10% of women trying to conceive go through miscarriages and 1% go through multiple miscarriages. And I've spoken to so many people who have told me, oh, I had three miscarriages. Someone told me they had 16 miscarriages before they, they got their final, you know, bundle of joy. And so I'm like, yeah, first of all, I don't know if I want to go through all that, right? And I said that I was going to draw the line at three. And I didn't know what that would look like. In my brain, it meant I'm going to stop trying altogether. It feels like after three, I don't think that I can get my body ready or recovered or healed so that I can continue with that process. Three sounded like and like so many, so many miscarriages. And it feels like so many miscarriages. But today, knowing that I have more options and that in a process like IVF, for example, they would weed out those tr trisomy anomalies and different kinds of issues. They would weed that out for you. And so 
listening to that, it gives me so much hope for the future. And so I still have a chance to carry my baby naturally. And so we'll see what that looks like and, and, and explore those options and avenues. But I can tell you right now that today, my outlook is very hopeful. It's not dire at all. And I am very open to all of the options. My husband and I have always wanted to have one biological baby and one adopted. So I'm very blessed and, and very fortunate that my company helps with those, all of those activities and all of those life-changing decisions. And so it's, it's something that I am honestly privileged because if I didn't have that support, I don't know if I could afford even considering any of those options, which are highly expensive and honestly for the privileged. So that is the latest and greatest in my journey trying to conceive. My hope is that by sharing my story, I shed a little bit more light on fertility, reproductive issues, and, and everything that comes with that, the hopes, the fears, the disappointments, and the celebrations. And so I'm here to share that with you and also to continue to fight for reproductive rights in America, in the United States, in the world, because this is a huge issue where women's health and women's health education is being stomped on and what i'm going through many 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 women go through and there is such a lack of education such a lack of information and such a taboo behind it so my goal really is to shed more light on women's reproductive issues and bring into the forefront because it's so important it affects more than 50 percent of the population of the world so are we not on the same page here Anyway, I'm going off on a tangent, but more to come on that. And uh, I'll see you guys at the women's reproductive rights protests around the US. Thank you guys so much for joining. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have anything to share, comments, feedback, questions, additional information, resources, please share them in the comments. Thank you so much for joining me today. Again, my name is Janelli. We are here at Blooming Lotus and I will see you guys next time.